So which exercises actually get you in ketosis faster? Legitimately, okay, like scientifically back. Which exercises are gonna allow your liver to produce more ketones, ultimately getting you through the keto flu, getting you through the hump, and creating those precious ketones the fastest? Okay, we're gonna break it all down because a lot of people think that it's all about just depleting your glycogen, burning up as many carbs as you possibly can so that you have no carbs left and ultimately start burning fat. It's not quite that simple because we can burn fat and carbs at the same time, even when we're in ketosis. So which exercises truly do get you into keto faster? We're gonna break it all down. Hey, we've got new videos come out just about every single day right now. 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. Nobody's got us beat when it comes down to how much good quality content we're putting out. So make sure you're hitting that subscribe button and then hit that bell icon to turn on notifications so you never miss a beat. I also wanna make sure you check out Peely Hunters. I've talked about Peely Nuts before. Peely Nuts are the highest fat, lowest carb nut that is out there. Okay, it's a Filipino nut, and these guys have absolutely crushed it when it comes down to the quality. So we're talking 22 grams of really healthy saturated fat that's in these nuts and totally sprouted so they're gonna digest and absorb. So I wanna make sure you check them out after you watch this video. They've got some really cool nut butters too. They've got like a matcha peeling nut butter, which just tastes amazing. So anyway, after we get through all this, check them out down below in the description. Anyhow, let's get down to the science of how this all works. The first thing we have to look at is aerobic activity. Okay, that's going for a walk, going for a run. Okay, aerobic activity is generally occurring anywhere between like 25% and 60% of our maximum heart rate. Okay, it's that low intensity range. Now, the reason that aerobic activity utilizes fat so much is because essentially it has time to take fat and combine it with oxygen. Now, I don't want to like overcomplicate anything here. I want to get down into the nitty gritty of these other things. And this is going to be a somewhat complex video anyway, because it's a complex topic. So when you're working at a low intensity, at like 25 to 40% or so of your maximum heart rate, your body is pulling fatty acids that are already flowing through the blood. So fatty acids that have already kind of moved around and mobilized and they're now in the blood. Your body starts using those for energy. Okay, but when you start increasing the intensity up to about 60%, the fat ends up getting pulled from what are called intramyocellular triglycerides. Okay, it's getting pulled from fatty tissue or fatty acids that are in the skeletal muscle tissue. So the point is, is 25 to 60%, we're burning fat. We're using fat as a fuel source and it's getting mobilized. Once we start getting upwards of 60, we get up to like 70, 75%, that goes down. The amount of fat we're using for fuel actually goes down. Okay, now, Additionally, what ends up happening is as we start increasing in intensity, like when we're weight training or we're sprinting, we also have the utilization of carbohydrates that comes into the mix. We start using carbs, whether it's from stored glycogen or from carbs that we ate. Now, when this comes into supply energy, it of course takes away from fatty acid mobilization because our body's like, hey, we have carbs, we don't need the fats now. So higher intensity equals carbohydrate metabolism, lower intensity equals fat metabolism. That makes it pretty simple, right? It makes sense that, okay, at that rate, we wanna do cardio because we just wanna mobilize fat. Well, let me explain things a little bit more because it gets a little bit hairier than this. When we're at a high intensity, blood flow ends up getting shuttled away from the fat tissue, okay? So that's one of the reasons why we don't burn as much fat during a workout itself. Now, we can burn fat long-term doing high intensity work. Don't get me wrong, I love high intensity work and it does burn a lot of fat but when it comes down to mobilizing fatty acids and creating ketones from those, it's all about the slow burn and getting that stuff to the liver so it can create ketones. We want those fats to come from the body into the bloodstream, into the liver to create ketones. And when we do high intensity work, what happens is blood flow gets shuttled away from the adipose tissue to actually move the muscle, to move those muscle cells and to move the core and to move the vital organs that are pumping a lot of blood, right? Pumping blood through them. So that means that fat gets kind of stuck. It gets kind of stuck in the adipocytes. It gets stuck in the fat cell level. Okay, so that's a big reason why high intensity doesn't move as much fat. The other thing is something that has to do with CPT1 enzymes. Okay, the enzyme CPT1 is involved in the carnitine transport shuttle, that whole process of carnitine allowing fat into the mitochondria. So carnitine is kind of like a bus that allows fat into the cell. Now, if CPT1 lessens, then we don't move as much fat into the mitochondria. During high intensity work, CPT1 down regulates. High intensity work slows down CPT1. And it makes sense, right? Why would we wanna be shuttling fat into the cell when the cell is predominantly using carbs, when it's burning hot, when it's running really fast, when we're doing high intensity work? Okay, so CPT1 is now down regulated. Now, additionally, once carbohydrates are being used, it also upregulates something known as malonyl coenzyme A. 
I know I'm getting complex and I promise I'll make some sense of it. I'm just, I have to explain it for those that are into the super nerdy stuff. The malanol coenzyme A also inhibits CPT1. So basically, long story short, is when you do cardio, fat is being mobilized more. As soon as the intensity gets high, then you're using carbohydrates and the fats aren't being mobilized. So that begs the question. Now we have two glaring things that are still opposing. On one side, we say, okay, well, low intensity is great because it's mobilizing fat. Perfect, that's the answer, right? Then on the other hand, we have people saying, well, ketones can't be produced unless we drain our glycogen stores. And for those of you that don't know, glycogen is what's the carbs that are stored in our muscle. So people have always told us, you have to, you have to burn through the glycogen stores first, and once those are burned, then you can produce ketones. I don't necessarily think that's the case, okay? And I'll explain with some legit science that backs it up. I think it has more to do with the aerobic side of things. Here's why. If we look at Jeff Volek's study, Jeff Volek published a very famous study that takes a look at athletes that are either low carb or high carb. And he found that when they do endurance work, the low carb group burns 2.3 times more fat during their workout than the high carb group. And at the end of the workout, had the same amount of stored muscle glycogen as the high carb group. The low carb group and the high carb group had the same amount of stored muscle glycogen, yet the low carb group burned 2.3 times more fat. So what does that tell us? It tells us that glycogen doesn't really matter because you can be on a keto diet and still have high amounts of glycogen. So I firmly believe that you do not have to drain glycogen to produce ketones. There could be a correlation but it's not causation. And what I mean by that is it could be a correlation that maybe the amount of time it takes to drain our glycogen stores could roughly be about the same amount of time it takes for ketogenesis to occur, meaning it takes roughly that amount of time to start producing ketones. Maybe it's just a coincidence, okay? Because this is pretty interesting. And then we start diving in a little bit deeper and start making some more sense of this. The journal Cell published a study that found that when it came down to mobilizing lipids and ultimately creating ketones, leptin was just as important as insulin and just as important as anything else. Meaning we weren't able to really burn or mobilize fat unless leptin levels were low and insulin levels were low. Now leptin is like the cheat meal hormone, okay? Leptin is what communicates from the fat cell to the brain to let the brain know that there's enough fat on hand. So when leptin levels start to go down and insulin levels go down, fat can get mobilized. High intensity exercise has no effect on leptin. So high intensity exercise, all it really does is activate what's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It basically gets catecholamines going. So it basically makes it so that your body is revving up the metabolism because adrenaline's going, epinephrine's going, and this and that. It does not mean that you're automatically burning carbs or burning fat, especially if leptin isn't elevated. So there's other hormonal systems at play here. High intensity exercise actually makes it so that leptin doesn't drop at all. Like it doesn't have a big effect there. Now, this is wild stuff and I know I might be losing you, but I know some of you guys are, are hanging in there and I will make some total sense of this. So please just listen to all this jargon, okay? I beg of you. Some of you might be wondering, okay, well, what about doing eccentric work? Okay, what about trying to burn up as much glycogen as I can, but not through high intensity? Okay, there are ways that you can burn up muscle glycogen without doing super high intensity work. For example, eccentric contractions, where you take a weight and you just move really slow on the eccentric, okay, and you break down the muscles. That used to be what I thought would be the trick. I used to tell people that. I used to say that's the best way to get into ketosis because you burn up glycogen, but you're not going super, super highly anaerobic. You're just burning up the glycogen. There's a study that was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology that shed some light on that. It took a look at individuals that did 75 minutes of cycling followed by either eccentric work or concentric work, meaning they focused on doing reps where they focused on the concentric movement or the eccentric movement. And then they measured their glycogen resynthesis rates, like how long it took and how easily they were able to restore glycogen. On day one, both groups were able to restore glycogen at the same rate. On day three, the group that did the eccentric work, the group that did the slow repetitions, had 25% less glycogen uptake. Why? They did just as much damage, they worked out just as hard, just one did slower repetitions down, one did more repetitions up. And 
What it turns out happens is when you're doing eccentric work, you do a lot of structural damage to the cell. So it turns out the sarcoplasm actually gets damaged. Okay, so the muscle cell gets damaged to the point where it physically blocks glycogen from being able to come in. What does this mean in the world of ketosis? Where is Thomas going? Trust me, I'm not crazy. I just, I'm just wild on this stuff, okay? What that tells us is something simple. When we are trying to recover from an eccentric workout, the demand is still there. Okay, our muscles are still demanding recovery from glycogen. They want it, they need it, but the structural blockade is preventing it from happening, which frustrates the body because it's still trying. It's like, okay, let me produce more glycogen, give you more glycogen, give you more glycogen, but it's not even getting into the cell. It's not getting there because it's damaged, because you did so much damage with your workout. It can't get in. Okay, where does this matter with keto? If you are not eating carbohydrates, that means that because gluconeogenesis is demand-driven, because your body needs the carbohydrates, it's going to pull them from protein. And normally that's not that much of an issue, but when you're first trying to get into ketosis, then it makes it so that your body is having to break down lots and lots and lots of protein, creating excess glucose because it can't get into the cell. That excess glucose could thereby prevent you from going into ketosis or slow down the process in which your liver creates ketones. So the whole simple point of all of this to summarize for everybody is my hypothesis on all this based on the research is that aerobic activity going for a simple walk or a run at 50 to 60% of your maximum heart rate is going to get your fats mobilized and get you into ketosis much faster than weight training. Does that mean that you shouldn't weight train? Not at all, I think you should but your ultimate go-to and for what you should tell your friends and family that are doing the keto diet, they should be doing simple aerobic activity. It's gonna get them into ketosis faster than anything else in the safest, most effective way without any ambiguity and without any of this crazy nonsensical scientific jargon that I just threw at you. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my channel and I apologize for all the complexity of this one. Rewatch it a couple times if you have to. See you soon.